Hello and welcome to Indus News live from Islamabad. I am Muneeb Hamid with the news of this hour. Let's begin with the headlines first. India has reported the highest daily coronavirus cases in the world today with over 61,500 new infections and 933 deaths. The U.S. has registered more than 58,000 cases and 1,243 deaths in a day. In Brazil, over 50,000 people have tested positive for the virus since yesterday, while 1,079 more died. Here in Pakistan, COVID-19 daily death toll continues to decline, with 14 fatalities, taking the tally to 6,068. The global number of COVID-19 cases has crossed 19.2 million with more than 719,000 deaths. Hong Kong has slammed the United States sanctions on its chief executive, Carrie Lam, saying the curbs are savage and unreasonable. The territory's Commerce Secretary, Edward Yao, warned of a potential blowback for U.S. businesses in the financial hub. Meanwhile, Beijing has called the U.S. move clowning action, saying these threats cannot frighten the Chinese people. The top U.S. counterintelligence official has warned that Russia, China and Iran are trying to interfere in the 2020 presidential election. In a statement, National Counterintelligence and Security Center Director William Evanina said the three countries are using online disinformation and other means to influence voters and stir up disorder in the country. In Somalia, eight people have been killed and 14 others injured in a blast at a military base in the capital Mogadishu. A military official said the attack appeared to be a suicide car bomb explosion. No group has claimed responsibility so far. In Afghanistan, chairman of the consultative peace Jirga Abdullah Abdullah says the decision on the release of 400 Taliban prisoners will be announced today. Abdullah said the decision will be made under the suggestion submitted by the consultative committees of the Loya Jirga. News in detail after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back now for the news in detail. India has reported the highest daily coronavirus cases in the world today with over 61,500 new infections and 933 deaths. The U.S. has registered more than 58,000 cases and 1,243 deaths in a day. In Brazil, over 50,000 people have tested positive for the virus since yesterday, while 1,079 more died. The global number of COVID-19 cases has crossed 19.2 million, with more than 719,000 deaths. The coronavirus pandemic continues to cost thousands of lives daily as many countries seek to lift restrictions. As the U.S. death toll surpassed 160,000, schools have been reopened in several states for in-person classes. Brazilian health officials are overwhelmed by dealing with cases as over 50,000 more people have tested positive, increasing tally to nearly 3 million. Cuba's success story in fighting the coronavirus was short-lived after a spike in fresh cases, causing backtrack on further reopening of the economy. We have returned to measures in place to reduce community spread in Havana, with all limitations and demands that are applicable to this phase and as well as the sacrifices that this entails for everyone, for institutions, for the public sector, for the private sector, for our citizens who live here in the capital. South Korea has reported an increase with 43 new cases in the past 24 hours, up from 20 on the day before. Mainland China has reported 31 fresh cases overnight, down from 37 a day earlier. Hong Kong Chief Executive Carrie Lam said people should have confidence in the government in these testing times. This testing team has been here for a few days. I think they are very serious and professional, so I have full confidence in them. I think the citizens in Hong Kong should feel the central government's care for Hong Kong. 
Over in Europe, Ireland's Prime Minister Michael Martin has announced a lockdown in three counties amid a surge of new cases. In the UK, Preston has become the latest city to face virus lockdowns after a rise in infections. France has reported a record daily cases of over 2,000 since the lockdown was lifted in June. Meanwhile, in Pakistan, 14 more people have died from COVID-19 in the last 24 hours, raising the total to 6,068. The health ministry says 842 cases were reported overnight as the tally crossed 283,000. The ministry said over 259,000 people have recovered from the virus so far. It said there are now over 17,000 active cases in the country. Sindh remains the worst hit province with over 123,000 infections, while Punjab has reported more than 94,000 cases. Meanwhile, the government has announced the standard operating procedures for the nation's Independence Day and Muharram month. Now, Hong Kong has slammed the U.S. sanctions on its chief executive, Kerry Lam, saying the curbs are savage and unreasonable. The territory's Commerce Secretary Edward Yao warned of a potential blowback for U.S. businesses in the financial hub. Meanwhile, Beijing has called the U.S. move clowning action, saying these threats cannot frighten the Chinese people. In a statement, China's liaison office said intentions of the U.S. politicians to support anti-China chaos in Hong Kong have been revealed. Earlier, Washington said it imposed sanctions on the officials directly responsible for implementing Beijing's policies. The top U.S. counterintelligence official has warned that Russia, China and Iran are trying to interfere in the 2020 presidential election. National Counterintelligence and Security Center Director William Avernina in a statement said three countries are using online disinformation and other means to influence voters and stir up disorder in the country. Avernina said China views U.S. President Donald Trump as unpredictable and will prefer him to lose the election in November. Said Russia was working to malign former Vice President and Democratic presidential candidate Joe Biden due to his anti-Moscow stance. The NCSC chief said Iran was influencing the polls under the perception that Trump's re-election will result in off continuation of Washington's pressure on Tehran. I think that the last person Russia wants to see in office is Donald Trump because nobody's been tougher on Russia than I have ever. That's not uh, well, I don't care what anybody says. Nobody, nobody with any common sense would say, do it. Look at what we've done with our military. Look at what we've done in exposing the pipeline with billions of dollars going to Russia. Look at all of the things we've done with NATO, where I've raised $130 billion a year from countries that were delinquent, and now they're paying all of this money. China would love us to have an election where Donald Trump lost to sleepy Joe Biden. They would dream. They would own our country. If Joe Biden was president, China would own our country. Meanwhile, in response to the top intelligence head statement, Trump said the last thing Russia, China and Iran want will be for him to win the election. Still in the U.S., the Congress negotiations over another stimulus package for the coronavirus battered economy have failed. Democrats and Republicans remain at odds over almost all aspects of the bill, including unemployment benefits and cash injections for states. The Republicans want legal protections for employers against virus-related health claims while reducing the $600 a week unemployment benefits. The Democrats prefer a bigger package than the one proposed by the Republicans, which is closer to $1 trillion in total. In a news briefing, Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer said the Democrats were willing to meet the Republicans in the middle. It was a disappointing meeting. Um, we reiterated in very strong terms our offer. We come down a trillion from our top number, which is three, four. They go up a trillion from their top number, which was one. And that way we could begin to meet in the middle. Unfortunately, they rejected it. They said they couldn't go much above their existing one trillion. And that was disappointing. Well, earlier in May, Democratic-controlled House passed a $3.5 trillion stimulus bill, but the Republicans held Senate rejected it. Now, moving on, in Somalia, eight people have been killed and 14 others injured in a blast at a military base in the capital, Mogadishu. 
A military official said the attack appeared to be a suicide car bomb explosion. The witnesses said a suicide bomber reportedly drove an explosive-laden vehicle into the military base. They said the blast went off close to a stadium when the explosion was heard. No group has claimed responsibility so far. Now over to Afghanistan, where the chairman of Consultative Peace, Jirga Abdullah Abdullah, says the decision over releasing 400 Taliban prisoners will be announced today. Abdullah said the decision will be made under the suggestions submitted by the consultative committees of the lawyer Jirga. Abdullah said 33 out of 50 CPJ working committees submitted their suggestions yesterday, while 17 others will submit their suggestions today. He said the people of Afghanistan and international community are looking forward to a positive and constructive outcome. Earlier, Afghan President Ashraf Ghani said releasing 400 remaining Taliban prisoners does not lie under his constitutional powers. Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan has congratulated his Sri Lankan counterpart Mahinda Rajapaksa on his party's electoral victory. In a phone call with Rajapaksa, Khan reaffirmed Pakistan's full support to Sri Lanka in all areas of cooperation. Khan also extended his invitation to Rajapaksa to visit Pakistan at his earliest convenience. He expressed hope that ties between the two countries will be strengthened even further during Rajapaksa's new term. For his part, Rajapaksa shared Sri Lanka's current COVID-19 situation and its negative impact on the tourism industry in the country. The two countries were closely within the framework of SARC. Now, Pakistan has told the United Nations Security Council that India is the biggest source of terrorism in the South Asian region. Interesting, a United Nations Security Council session on threats to international peace and security, Pakistan's envoy Munir Akram said, Islamabad will continue to expose India. He added the recent attack on the Pakistan Stock Exchange building in Karachi was perpetrated by Indian-sponsored mercenaries. The envoy went on to say that India's patronage of terrorism has been proved by the arrest of raw serving terrorist commander Kulboshan Yadev. Yadev has confessed to espionage and terrorism in Pakistan. Moving on now, the death toll from an Indian passenger aircraft accident has risen to 20, while 16 people have been severely injured. There were 191 people on board when the plane from Dubai overshot the runway at an airport in the southern state of Kerala due to heavy rain and split into two parts. Aviation officials say the pilot of the flight could not sight the runway in the first landing attempt due to heavy rains. Plane manufacturer Boeing has offered technical assistance to probe the cause behind the accident. An Air India Express statement has said both pilots were also among those died. Meanwhile, Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan expressed grief over the loss of innocent lives in the accident. Meanwhile, the United Nations says nine children have been killed in an airstrikes in northern Yemen. In a statement, UN humanitarian coordinator Lies Grant said mostly women and children were hit while travelling by road. Without accusing any warring side, Grant said the attack was shocking and completely unacceptable. But the Houthi rebels claimed the government coalition conducted six air raids in Jauf province and placed the, the death toll above 20. Meanwhile, coalition spokesperson says they are looking into the allegations of civilian casualties. So far, more than 100,000 people have been killed in Yemen's conflict, creating the world's worst humanitarian disaster. More news coming up after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Now moving on with the stories. The United States has imposed sanctions on the leader of a Central African Republic-based militia group 3R. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says the curves will prevent such actors from benefiting from the U.S. financial system. The U.S. Treasury Department has accused the militia leader Siddiqui Abbas of human rights abuse including torture. In a statement, it said the militia group has killed, tortured, raped or displaced thousands of people since 2015. 
Earlier, a United Nations Security Committee also imposed sanctions on the militia leader. Now, Russia has asked Twitter to label Western media accounts as state-affiliated outlets. In a tweet, the foreign ministry compared Russia's tagged media handle with that of unlabeled German, British and American accounts. It said Russian media outlets are labeled as state-owned, but others are not, even though they are handled by the respective governments. Earlier, Twitter added that new labels to government officials, including foreign ministers and diplomats. The microblogging giant clarified state finance media organizations with editorial independence will not be labeled. Now, Lebanon's president, Michael Aoun, has rejected calls for an international probe into the Beirut port explosion. In a statement, the president said a foreign investigation will dilute the truth. He said there is a possibility of external interference through a rocket or bomb or some other act. The statement comes amid increasing demands from world leaders and Lebanese nationals abroad for an impartial investigation. Meanwhile, Hezbollah has denied allegations of storing weapons in the port warehouse. The blast on Tuesday killed 157 and injured over 5,000 people. Moving on, a Pakistan Air Force plane carrying eight tons of medical and food supplies has arrived in Lebanon. Earlier, Pakistan's Foreign Minister Shami Mut Qureshi telephoned his Lebanese counterpart to express regret over Beirut tragedy. Qureshi assured Chabil Webe of full solidarity and cooperation from Pakistan. He said the Prime Minister and President had already conveyed profound sympathies and condolences to the Lebanese leadership. The Kremlin says President Vladimir Putin has called his Belarusian counterpart Alexander Lukashenko to discuss the arrest of 33 Russian nationals. In a statement, it said both leaders expressed confidence that the situation will be resolved amicably. The Kremlin said Moscow seeks a stable political situation in Minsk and holding the upcoming presidential poll in a calm environment. In a separate statement, the press service of Lukashenko said the detention of the Russian citizens was one of the main topics on the agenda. In late July, 33 Russian nationals allegedly linked to the private military company Wagner were arrested in Belarus. According to Lukashenko, they were going to destabilize the presidential election schedule for the 9th of August. Russia's Aerial Forest Protection Service says it's tackling around 103 fires raging over an area of 71,000 hectares. The deputy chief of the service said about 66 forest fires covering an area of 720 hectares have been extinguished already. Forest fire services and paratroopers are also working to put out fires in Russia's Yakutia and Kurgan regions. The wildfires have reached into the boreal forests and tundra that blanket northern Russia. The high temperatures in the northern part of the country have fueled massive wildfires and melted permafrost. Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban says the illegal migrants pose a biological threat amid the coronavirus pandemic. In an interview, Orban said Hungarians have to think about self-defense even if it angers certain groups. Orban said he has asked the Interior Minister to make sure armed forces and police continue to take action against all attempts at illegal entry Hungary, reinforce borders with troops and police with the support of its partners, Czechia, Poland and Slovakia. A state of emergency has been declared in border regions along with increased penalties for illegal crossings. Hungary has registered just over 4,600 coronavirus cases and 602 deaths so far. Canada's 4,000-year-old Mile Ice Shelf has broken apart due to rising climate temperatures. Government agency Canadian Ice Service said about 43% of the shelf broke off with the rupture likely to have happened around July 30th. The agency said satellite photos show the large ice platform broke apart into two giant icebergs and several other smaller ones. It said the shelf located on the northwestern edge of Ellesmere Island were country's last intact ice shelf in the Arctic. Canadian Ice Service said the shelf shrunk by about 80 square kilometers, an area larger than the island of Manhattan in New York. Temperatures in this polar region this year have been severely high as the polar sea ice hit its lowest extent for July in 40 years.
Manchester City and Lyon have reached the quarterfinals of the UEFA Champions League. City beat Real Madrid by two goals to one at the Etihad Stadium, while Lyon lost to Juventus by two goals to one, but advanced by the virtue of away goals. Already trailing 2-1 from the first leg, Real gifted City a ninth-minute opener after Rafael error led to a Raheem goal. The Spaniards hit back through Karim, but Gabriel pounced upon another Varane mistake in the second to settle the tie 4-2 on aggregate. In Turin, a Cristiano Ronaldo brace for the old lady went in vain as a first-half Memphis Depay penalty proved decisive for the French side. Lyon clunge on for a two-all aggregate draw as Turin Giants wait for the Champions League in Lingers, on which they last won in 1996. Lyon will meet Manchester City in next week's one-off quarter-final at the Final A tournament in Lisbon. And now let's have a look at the weather updates across the globe. Well, that's all for now. For the latest updates, you can follow us on social media at Indus.news. Take care.